Ahmed Karim Gültikin, he is a, a Philip Schwarz Fellow in the Leipzig University. He's a social, political, cultural anthropologist and uh, ethnographer working uh, mainly uh, in, in, the, in the Dersim uh, region. Um, so in Turkey, um, mountains, and he will speak now on this, on, 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 the, on the belief there uh, and the religion in this region and the connection to religion and territory. Go ahead. Uh, I'm very glad that you are that you are here, Ahmed. Okay. Thanks so much, Tobias, and thank you for providing us such an opportunity. I met you all in Erlangen, and your presentations I really found them really interesting, and they made me think a lot about my own uh, works. Yeah, as you said, actually, I was a I was working on Kurdish Alevis in Dersim region, but I got dismissed uh, due to some political reasons from my uh, position in the university. Then I found myself as a refugee academic in Germany. And I've been here just for three years. And I'm trying to uh, work on my projects here, uh, continue my projects here in, in Germany. So let me share my screen first with you. Uh, so today I would like to take you to Eastern Turkey and I want to talk about a particular community living in a unique geography in Turkey where it's well known for its legendary mountains and its rebellious uh, inhabitants. But of course, before going on, I would like to make a very short introduction to Dersim, to Kurdish Alevis and the Rahaki belief system for those of you who need to get familiar with the topic. So Dersim should be understood not just a province, but a large region encompassing several neighboring provinces in Eastern Turkey, where Kurdish Alevis live. Instead, it's a name for a mind map of Kurdish Alevis, a sacred land demarcated by mountains that frames a complicated network of both tribes and respective sacred places. The core of Dersim is the Tunceli province today, you can see on the map. The name Tunceli in Turkish, it means bronze hand, symbolizing the ultimate victory of the young modern Turkish Republic against mountainous feudal Kurdish tribes. A significant example reflecting the violent history as well as the contemporary traumatized situation in Dersim today. The Tunceli province was also named as Inner Dersim for centuries by Ottoman and later by its successor Turkish authorities. The term gives a comprehensive understanding of how the geography and Kurdish Alevi history and society have deeply bonded. On the one hand, the term Inner Dersim refers to an impregnable landscape full of high mountain ranges, deep valleys, dense forests for states, making it almost impossible to conduct military operations against rebellious tribes. However, on the other hand, Kurdish Alevis also refer to this part of Dersim with particular terms compared to other parts, such as Jar Diyar, which means the sacred land, protected, protecting them from invaders for centuries. Moreover, Kurdish Alevis perceive Dersim as a living being full of non-human entities in the shape of mountains, rivers, lakes, wild animals, etc. Kurdish Alevis lived in this relatively isolated geography in a complicated network of tribes until the 20th century. Starting especially from the ninth, early 19th century, Eastern Anatolia fell into continuous bloody skirmishes between Ottomans, afterwards the Turkish Republic, and local non-Muslim groups. The Ottoman and their successor aimed to engineer the local population to create a Sunni, Muslim, and later ethnically Turkish dominated population. Before that, the region consisted of several ethnic and religious groups, such as Christians, Jews, Alevis, Armenians, Ezidis, Assyrians, etc. However, after almost a century long bloodshed, only a handful of rebellious Kurdish Alevi tribe, tribes left in the, in the Dersim region, a natural fortification to be Turkified and Sunnified in the late 1930s. The 1938 genocidal massacre of Kurdish Alevis in Tunceli province 
marked the end of traditional tribal life. However, just a few decades later, the Dersim Mountains became a legendary zone of guerrilla warfare against the Turkish state in the late 1960s, which remains so. In 1994, when the skirmishes between several guerrilla groups and the Turkish army intensified, the Turkish state again declared a spatial law for the province, as it was done in 1938, and evacuated Kurdish Alevis from almost all the rural settlements that uh, settlements. That event marks a decisive breaking point of everyday life and the start of another forced social transformation process that gives birth to the modern Kurdish Alevi identity in the 21st century. Since the 90s, Kurdish Alevis massively immigrated to Western Europe, especially to Germany. And since then, they have been defined as a transnational community in academic circles. Kurdish Alevis define their belief system as rahaki, which means the path of the truth. It is rooted in enclosed tribal networks, which emerge through real and fictional kinship patterns and can be understood through two underpinning aspects of the belief system. First is the ikrar, the sacred oath, a set of mandatory sacralized social relations and institutions. The Ikrar legitimates and regulates socio-religious relationships among individuals as well as tribes. Ikrar-based institutions, together with their religious and cultural heritage, proceed over everyday social life. Here, there are two main components, the sacred lineages and their followers. This caste-like system is unique to Kurdish Alevis, and every individual gains its socio-religious position by birth. Second, the prominence of beliefs and rituals regarding sacred places, which doesn't require formal religious guidance or authority, allows more space for individual piety. Rituals at sacred places rely on worshiping nature-based living or non-living objects, such as trees, forests, mountains, rocks, rivers, lakes, fire, soil, wild animals, or celestial objects, such as sun, moon, or stars. In everyday life, religious needs are supplied through sacred place worshiping practices. While the Ikrar-based organizations cover the social ritual sphere, the sacred place cults give more independence to individuality in the sense of religious experience. That integrally creates a considerable space for interpretation of new political discourses related to nature and religion. For example, as Dersim is considered sacred, the current ethnopolitics, which is cited ecology, quickly conceptualized a new nature-based religion. The atrocities of the 20th century have torn apart the traditional way of living in Dersim. The religious obligatory relations and institutions between tribes have broken. Forced evacuations and mass migration to Western Europe have caused a continuous and effective social transformation for almost half a century. However, the commitment of Kurdish Alevis to Dersim as a sacred land has remained. Moreover, sacred places have become the prominent aspect of sustaining religious practices and even ethnic discourses. Nowadays, the featured face of ethnopolis of Dersim and Kurdish Alevi identity is dominated by ecological discourses. In that regard, mountains as pilgrimage sites, rivers as living souls, Particular places on the mountains, such as forests, a pile of rocks, or an uncommonly large cliff as living places of deific beings, are all considered to be cornerstones of an extensive collective mind map. Much like the organizational model of a Kurdish Alevi tribe, there is a hierarchical and territorial demarcation among those sacred places. Thus, every square meter of Dersim directly relates to the perception of the sacred land, one deeply connected to individual with mythic or actual ancestral ties. The sacred image of Dersim thus symbolically presents itself as, as the sum of socio-spatial borders marked by sacred places, mainly in form of mountains. They are being transmitted across generations. Every phase of that history, which is strongly related to community survival, has been added to a layered, interconnected, collective mind of mythological narratives regarding the protective mountains. 
From mythology to actuality, each conflict reflects that understanding. Thus, there is an endless battle between those who want to destroy Dersim and those who protect, protect it in Rahaki cosmology, reflecting, for example, a deep sympathy for nowadays guerrillas in the mountains of Dersim, who fight in hostile conditions against a powerful army, or reflecting a sympathy to those who struggle to protect the nature of Dersim today. In this context, mountains plays a decisive role in creating and perceiving the Dersim image for Kurdish Alevis and outsiders, especially for the Turkish state. First, the mountains are true demarcators that separate the Kurdish Alevi social world from Turkey's deeply and forcefully Islamicized public sphere in, in recent decades. The sacred Munzur mountain chain gives birth to the sacred Munzur river, is on the west and north. The, mon the mountains on the east are also sacred to eastern Dersim tribes. They are all regarded as pilgrim sites. Both mountain ranges take Kurdish Alevis of inner Dersim under their protective wings. Finally, the Keban Dam Lake in the south border, which was submerged in the early 1970s, completes, this, completes the physical border of the sacred land. And it is also essential to mention that this border province is the only place in Turkey where Alevis are the majority. Alevis are the biggest religious minority in Turkey, and they have been immensely oppressed, discriminated, and subjected to violence continuously up to this day. Thus, the mountains of Dersim are still perceived as living sacred actors who fight for the good of their inhabitants. This perception fascinatingly reflected in Rahaki cosmology. Accordingly, there is an endless epic war between benevolent and malicious deific characters, mainly in, in the form of mountains, who wants to protect their sin and those who wants to destroy it. In that regard, the mountains of Dersim are constituent elements of Rahaki belief system. They are accepted as powerful and prestigious beings. Thus, most of them are regarded as pilgrim sites. For example, there is Duzgu Mountain in eastern Dersim. Every year, tens of thousands come to worship on the mountain, where there is no settlement on it, but a difficult path to follow, full of sacred places for pilgrims, a true reflection of sharing the agony of Duzgu. Duzgu is a young male character who lives in bottom worlds, capable of creating miracles. He is also a warrior and commander of all warrior sacred places, defending Dersim, from annual invasions of both non-human entities and foreign armies. There is a fascinating pantheon of the mountains, reflecting the complica complicated and interconnected mind map of Dersim. There are male and female mountains that share kinship patterns. They have various characters responding to their worshippers. They also have hierarchical relations with each other. Some mighty ones rule the others. Such perception of mountains also helps Kurdish Alevis sustain a discourse of their ethnic identity, most related to an understanding of outsider and insider dichotomy. Dersim is mainly portrayed as a mountainous refuge or a natural fortress isolated by high mountains. Those narrations are deeply connected, connected to a continuum of brutal violence during the 20th century. The years between 19 21 Kochkur Rebellion in the Western Dersim region and the, and the 1937 Dersim Rebellion, notably, witnessed a series of bloody conflicts. The last resistance and in the genocidal massacre of 1938, when tens of thousands were brutally killed. There were also forced evacuations and the land was torched. The second devastating event of the 20th century took place in the mid 90s. Many civilians publicly murdered. Most parts of Dersim were declared a military forbidden zone, a restriction that still applies to civilians. Even though the consequences of such unsuccessful rebellions, defeats, and massacres were horrendous, the resistance shown in defense of Dersim has subsequently been commemorated and honored as defeated but never surrendered. Thus, defending home becomes defending sacredness, a concept deeply related to the mountainous nature of the Dersim. Victimization as a way of producing ethnopolitics for Kurdish Alevis is deeply connected with such atrocities. With this regard, the mountains emerge as real places 
or solid proofs of both an unwritten, enduring historical past and pure actuality. Moreover, as a reflection of this functionality, they resemble a substantial symbolic capital for the cultural identity. The mountains still create physical boundaries, while new discourses, especially those concerning environmentalism, produce a new collective consciousness, a sacred and impregnable landscape full of mystic powers as well as martyred ancestor souls and a deep feeling of belongingness are regarded as the second power of Kurdish Arabism in this sense. Thus, the motivations underpinning the current environmental struggles in Dersim, such as anti-dump struggles to protect the rivers, often depend on the symbolization of victimized ancestors, martyrs, revolutionists, and, nat and natural beauty. The mountains are a living part of Rahaki cosmology via non-human entities, where humans also live together. Every mountain has individuals to remember the history, atrocities, ancestors, family bonds, social boundaries, socio-religious obligations, and new cause of ethnic identity. That is also why Kurdish Alevis are almost the only community in Turkey who gives a furious environmental struggle against mining companies, hunting sports, hydroelectric power dams, etc. Thus, to protect the mountains has a unique perception of the landscape as a living part of inherited identity in Dersim at the same level. Within this developing discourse, the threat of a new genocide is expanded to cover the more recent concept of ecocide. In this context, mountains are potent agents who actively participate in the reproduction of cultural identity, since the identities are full of reflections of boundaries in every aspect of everyday life. The older tradition that the sacred land must be defended from external threats is now dramatically refreshed. In the present day, more local, enclosed, and isolated identity agendas rooted in a unique cultural and religious belief system are updated by modernized international ecological assertions seeking to connect the struggle with a more comprehensive global network reflecting a contemporary Kurdish Alevism sustaining and reimagining itself for the 21st century. Yeah. Thank you for your patience. It would be all. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for this, this great lecture. Uh, I guess um, somebody likes to uh, to to place uh, to, to make a question now okay. or should be um, I will check also the other the Wuha platform if there's something no okay I have not noted one but uh, I, I guess uh, I, I think we, we go to the next uh, go on to the next um, um, presentation lecture of, of Mahmoud, and we will have to uh, 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 a discussion at the end, uh, a longer discussion at the end uh, of this uh, of this session. Well, thank you very much, another time for this uh, connection between uh, landscape and, and belief uh, in the in the Dersen territory, uh, and I think there will be some connections. With the other uh, the other presentations, the other lectures. So uh, I invite uh, Shaha Mahmoud um, Hanafi, who will be the next uh, presenter. I'm very glad that you that you also uh, are with us today. Um, Shaha is uh, is professor in history at the James Madison University, and he's uh, working mostly on uh, on Afghanistan, uh, in the also in the colonial, uh, in colonialism and decolonialism, uh, and uh, recently and overall in the in the Hindakush uh, region, uh, as we heard uh, or as as we as we, we discussed last time we met, um, and he is uh, working uh, recently or also for for a longer time, not recently since a long time on uh, on forests and on the timber. Industry um, in in the Indukish region. So, Shaha, 
please go on, uh, go ahead and start your presentation. Um, I hope I've unmuted myself and that I'm audible. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Tobias, for the presentation. And uh, thank you, Ahmed, for setting, uh, 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 I see some comparative uh, points between our presentations immediately. Look forward to pursuing those. Maybe I'll try to share my screen. Yes. Um, and I uh, hope this is visible. Yeah, it's, um, see it very well. Everything fine. Okay, Great. thank you. Go ahead. All right, then. Um, well, uh, I am very grateful for this opportunity to share with you what is basically, I like to think of it as a draft chapter on forests for an environmental history book on Afghanistan that I'm uh, slowly putting together. And my focus will be on the, the forests and forest products of the Hindu Kush region. Um, I will give a long-term kind of environmental history of this region, touching upon borders and religions and the use of timber. Um, I want to say that environmental history forces historians to think beyond the nation state to chronologies and geographies that are much deeper and wider than the boundaries of the nation states we take for granted today. Um, let me see if I can make this screen move. And um, the Hindu Kush is one spur of a larger mountain range, the Himalayas. And um, the Hindu Kush is a defining feature of Afghanistan. In environmental history terms, Afghanistan is best thought about not through its borders, but through the Hindu Kush, through the Indus and Oxus rivers, upon which the uh, cultural influences of Iran, India, and Islam give Afghanistan its uh, overall profile and cultural disposition today. I have tried um, to give you a larger map of the Himalayas here, of Afghanistan here, the Hindu Kush being kind of the spine of Afghanistan. The focus on forests will take us to the north, east region, and the eastern region uh, of Afghanistan as, as we uh, get moving today. Uh, I'd like to begin with the Products, the forest, the mountain and forest products of the Hindu Kush that have been circulating globally for millennia. Lapis lazuli is a world renowned product of the Hindu Kush that the Egyptian pharaohs consumed greatly, the pyramids and Queen Cleopatra. And of course, the process of mining and transporting lapis involves timber and lumber in. Uh, direct ways, but more directly, cedar from the forests of the Hindu Kush cycled through the Indus Valley civilization uh, in sustained and systematic ways for multiple centuries, beginning about the third millennia BC. So we have a really deep history of mountain commodities to track. Uh, in terms of religion, I'd like to emphasize Zoroastrianism's connection to the Hindu Kush region and the role of trees in Zoroastrianism in particular. This is the Sabze uh, Abarko, the cypress tree of Kashmar, which is one of the world's oldest trees dated between four and 5,000 years old. That uh, is, the legend says this is a tree that Zoroaster brought from paradise and gave to the king Vishtapa for founding the first fire temple. And Zoroastrianism really amplifies um, the sort of sacredness of evergreen trees. And we must position Zoroaster, the historical figure in northern Afghanistan, Balkh or Mazar-e-Sharif today. And of course, trees from the Hindu Kush 
uh, inform that region. In South Asia, the Hindu Kush forests are intimately connected to the Vedic uh, the Vedas as a body of literature and the religions that sprung from the Vedas, including Buddhism and Hinduism. In particular, the cedar tree um, is the tree of the gods and becomes a really uh, ingrained aspect of Vedic lore, particularly around the figure of Shiva and Shiva's consort or wife, Parvati and Durga, sometimes called Kali, and their son, Ganesha, the elephant-headed uh, uh, one we can see over here. The point is, is that cedar wood and cedar forests have a high prominence in the Vedas. Trees as a whole, many different types of trees also figure into Ayurvedic medicine historically. So branches, roots, stems, leaves from a variety of trees um, have a really uh, high symbolically elaborated and kind of uh, medical technologies built around trees. In Islam, Islam has a deep connection to mountains and trees. First of all, Jabal al-Nur, the mountain of light, where uh, Muhammad received the re revelation from the uh, angel Jibril in the cave Hira. The Quran has about uh, dozens of references, particularly to the date palm, both for food, but also the foliage for roofing. Many other trees are mentioned in the hadiths of Islam. Uh, the, the tamarisk tree, pomegranate tree, the fig tree, the olive tree is particularly noted for its medicinal purposes. And I um, mentioned this about Islam because Islam comes to Afghanistan and grafts its tree consciousness and culture onto existing uh, tree and mountain cultures. When Islam meets Afghanistan in about the uh, 10th century AD, about a thousand years ago, where in Afghanistan, two Islamic dynasties, the Ghaznavid and Ghorid dynasties, um, built monuments. And there's a very important place for wood in the architecture, sacred architecture of Islam, mosques and shrines, we can see up in the right, but also for structural features of minarets involving both the skeleton of the kind of frame of the structure itself, but also stairways, door frames, the pulpit or mihrabs of Islam have wooden features to them. And um, uh, the presence of Islam in Afghanistan in the 10th century AD also is the birth of Persian as a modern language. Ferdowsi was patronized at the court of the Ghaznavids and produced the Shahnama, which is the uh, world's longest epic poem, and it has a tremendous amount of attention to trees, including the uh, cypress tree of Kashmar, we mentioned for Zoroastrianism, and here, the wakwak tree that Skander found at the end of his travels, at the end of the world, with two trunks and two sets of male and female talking heads that foretold of Iskandar, Skander's uh, death. Really important role for trees and Persianate culture. Coming to about the year 1500, the founder of the Mughal Empire, Babur, made his name in Kabul and spent about 20 years, formative years in his life, in and around Kabul and the Hindu Kush before founding the Mughal Empire. And we see here his grave in Kabul. Babur, the founder of the Mughal Empire, is buried in Kabul. This is a chinar tree, a birch tree that is in uh, the 1950s, was in that garden. Babur left for us an autobiography called the Babur Nama that was sort of translated from Turkish into Persian and illustrated 
by the grandson, the perhaps the greatest Mughal ruler, Akbar. And the illustrations of the Babur Nama bring an environmental history of the Hindu Kush to life in so many different ways, with discussions of animals, plants, flowers, rivers, fish, the smells, dust, wind, all the elements of an environmental history are provided to us uh, in the Babur Nama. And uh, Babur gives us a really excellent description of Kabul's wood culture, which woods burn best when they're wet, which woods burn longest, which woods produce the best ashes, what is the best wood for uh, nighttime, uh, kind of a torch. Uh, so a tremendous amount of information about Kabul's wood culture. A number of other really um, specific trees. This tree near Peshawar, Babur visited. And um, this tree is a couple of thousand, a banyan tree near Peshawar. Um, a number of other trees in the Mughal sphere. The Mughals maintained a very intense interest in the Hindu Kush region. And um, in fact, uh, Humayun was born in Kabul and Kabul and Kandahar cycled between the Mughals and Safavids. There's a tremendous amount of um, environmental information from the Mughal era on the Hindu Kush. I want to just put this out here to emphasize Babur's intimate details of of these trees of the Hindu Kush and their plants, the various wines from various grapes, which regions have the best wines, uh, drugs, um, kind of medicines from plants. It's just so, it's such a wonderful resource uh, and underutilized as far as I can tell. Um, jumping to colonialism, the most important aspect of British colonialism is deforestation of the Himalayas for railroad building purposes. And cedar wood, the cedar forests of the Himalayas were depleted in extraordinary volumes to produce the uh, railroad sleepers, the ties that go between the metal rods. Um, in addition, British imperial forestry developed in relationship to railroads and the commercial exploitation of forests. And this is a picture of the Imperial uh, Forest Institute, the, the National Forest Institute of India today. And it's a world wood library. That's a fascinating uh, resource for Himalayan wood products. The British were into the Himalayas and Hindu Kush for commercial and political reasons, but also scientific reasons. So there's considerable mapping of the glaciers, of the passes, of the languages of the Hindu Kush region that again offers uh, students and scholars a wealth of resources. The British engagement of Afghanistan is marked by two wars. The first war roughly in 1840, the second war roughly in 1880. Leading up to the first war, the British produced the first kind of modern maps of the Hindu Kush. On the left, we see the map from Mount Stuart Elphinstone's, an account of the Kingdom of Kabul, perhaps the first and most famous colonial monograph on Afghanistan, where the mountains are of the Hindu Kush are mapped in a way that is very different from a similar map produced at the same time, based upon the same data, um, with a very different result. The point to emphasize here in these different maps using the same data for the same region is the inconsistencies and the contradictions and gaps in colonial knowledge of forests and really anything. Uh, colonialism is not a stable body of knowledge. It's full of um, a lot of problematic relationships between data. 
The second war in Afghanistan really brings what we think of Afghanistan into vision today. Afghanistan as we know it with its borders, with a great deal of alienation between state and society, um, begins with the ruler Abdul Rahman, who is positioned as a British appointee and a recipient of British subsidies in 1880. Abdul Rahman used British subsidies to develop an an industrial is a, uh, a kind of set of industrial workshops. He hired English technocrats and bought a lot of English industrial equipment for these workshops. This is all steam driven uh, industrial material. And this steam workshop complex resulted in rapid deforestation of the Eastern regions. <clears throat> of Afghanistan. Abdul Rahman instituted commodity monopolies over timber um, to fuel the machine Khana. And the commodity monopoly that Abdul Rahman established was in the region of Parun, Afghanistan, in Kafiristan, what is known as Kafiristan. Kafiristan became known as Nuristan when it was forcibly Islamized by Abdul Rahman in 1896. Kafiristan has been an object of colonial fascination, Afghan state fascination, and international fascination. We begin with British sort of paintings and lithographs, <clears throat> later photographs <clears throat> of the kafir slaves who have been converted. The furniture of this region that enters the international art market, the wildlife of this region that brings in international conservationists, the language mapping of this region. The, the, the point is that Kafiristan has absorbed disproportionate amount of ethnographic attention in Afghanistan, which has led to Kafiristan being sort of defined as the region where there's a wood culture in Afghanistan. And we see this architecture that really does amplify the, uh, the wood basis of this cultural zone in Afghanistan. <clears throat> and I'd like to just build upon that very briefly here with reference to the timber, various uh, woods used for the construction of both houses, tombs, patios, and porches. And again, I must highlight up in the left, wine drinking is a big, uh, a big part of this region. The wood culture takes form in the idols, in the posts and pillars, rafters, beams, furniture, and doorways of these structures. All of which, um, a lot of this material has ended up in the Kabul Museum and international art markets. I'm interested in the <clears throat> craftsmen, the woodworkers, their organization, their training, their net their networks, their tools and technologies, and the role of blacksmiths is very important for these woodworkers because of metal tools. But I'm most interested in the loggers, in the lumberjacks, and their social organization, their hierarchies, their labor regimes are really the focus of my, of my interest. The Germans were a, instrumental in establishing the British Forestry School. Dietrich Brandeis was a German who served the British in India. The German interest in this region uh, takes shape in 1935 with the Dutch Hindu Kush expedition that was sent by the German government in search of the original plants for the original Aryan populations, a kind of genetic history of the Aryans. And so even this German mission um, really emphasized a kind of wood culture, although it was more or less a botanical expedition, a number of international expeditions emphasized the wood culture of this region 
And I'm here to say Afghanistan as a whole is a wood culture region. There is no region, there's no population in Afghanistan that is not dependent upon wood for architecture, heating, fuel, or aesthetic purposes. And in a sense, the uh, uh, reduction of wood culture to Kafiristan um, has misled uh, scholars about the role of wood elsewhere in the country. We see evidence of a robust Kabul wood market um, that uh, sort of is a modern day echo of Babur. Um, and so the Mark, the modern markets for Hindu Kush timber uh, are something we need to keep in mind. Okay. In the 20th century, there's a good deal of international travel to Afghanistan. We have here, the, again, another German, Niedermeyer, uh, who took a number of pictures throughout the country emphasizing the wood culture here of Kabul's architecture before Kabul became a sort of cement steel uh, uh, city. It was a, a lumber, wood, and brick city. Now, in the middle century, <clears throat> the Americans are involved in Afghanistan uh, beginning in the 40s. And what the Americans notice is a transboundary timber trade. And what this report indicates is uh, an agreement between the Afghan government and a ruler in British India for the transport of 10,000 logs down the Kunar River. The point is that the river begins in British India, comes through Afghanistan, and go then goes back to British India. And now we're talking about transboundary commodity flows that speak to the problems of boundaries in this region. <clears throat> After World oh, War II, yeah. We, we are also already on 20 minutes. I'll, I'll take company. just a couple more minutes, okay? <laughs> okay. Just, just a couple more minutes. Try to sum it up. Mm. Yep, yep. The um, issue of Pashtunistan brought in a lot of international development. Again, Western Germans in the region of Paktia went through a, a big forestry effort that came to naught because the Soviets ended up napalming this region. The Americans have been brutalizing the forests of the Hindu Kush beginning with the Tora Bora campaign in December 2001 leading up to the mother of all bombs in April 2017. For 20 years, there has been a relentless bombardment of the Hindu Kush, its natural and human environment. The most devastating consequence of the American presence from aerial bombardment to military bases is toxins, depleted uranium from munitions and the toxicity of military bases military bases that are structured by the human terrain teams and provincial reconstruction teams that have polluted the environment and securitized and militarized the, the attention to the wood trade that's tied to counterinsurgency. And we have basically the timber trade in, uh, from the American perspective tied to insurgencies. And the greatest threat to all this is the water supply. Radiation in the groundwater of Afghanistan will render the Hindu Kush uninhabitable in the long run. And that is a war crime. And I ask for international scholarly attention to this absolute catastrophe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah Shaha. And uh, we have seen a second time the, the interconnectedness also between uh, the protection of nature and uh, and live, you know, people living there. I uh, invite already right now uh, uh, Javier Javier Esteban. Um, Javier is also a historian uh, at the University of the Basque Country. Um, working on the Basque country, uh, actually, um, more on, not on, 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 on the contemporary 
but uh, on the 17th, 16th, 18th, and 19th century, mostly, as I have in mind from from last uh, from last meeting, also. Um, so, please uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you, uh, Tobias, uh, for the organization. Uh, I would like to send some regards to Jan Peter also, whenever he can watch this. And thank you all for this online session that permit sharing and contrasting so many researches on different Alpine region. Let's let's hope that the, our next meeting is face by face. Okay, so I will uh, just share um, my screen. Okay, so here we are, everything okay, right? Yeah. So in this paper, I will describe some discourses created by certain Basque elites um, used to justify collaboration or resistance against different imperial polities, mainly during the so-called age of revolutions. As we are about to see, even if the main features of an older discourse are maintained, relevant details changed from context to context. Um, as it is claimed in the panel's abstract, religiosities may provide important justifications on, of collaboration or resistance against imperial pursuits. The Basque case fits with this pattern. Even more in an age when people inhabiting a certain territory were divided in a great variety of jurisdictional communities. So uh, the religious features could gather them in a common identity. So another map. Let's begin with a very brief context of the particular borderscape of the Basque Pyrenees nowadays. Uh, I cannot focus on details, so in the picture you have got some extra information and location of each Basque land. Um, as you know, Basques are divided between France and Spain by the boundary located at the Pyrenees, considered as one of the oldest and most stable political boundaries in Western Europe. We could claim that the border was settled in the 16th century with minor changes from that moment on. At this very same time, certain Basques from the Spanish Basque provinces, the one in green in the picture, created a hegemonic discourse in order to justify their particular laws and institutions. I will start this paper describing such a discourse and focusing on its religious features. Then I will focus on how this discourse was endangered during the French revolutionary cycle and how different alternatives were suggested at that time. The beginning of the 16th century was a crucial moment for the ruler class of the three Basque provinces. They were faithful subjects of the Catholic majesty, that is, the King of Castile. As it was normal at the time, they enjoyed a notable self-government. Castile was one of the most dynamic polities of Europe. Uh, it was expanding its influence there and in the Americas. So the rulers of the Basque provinces needed to encompass universal claims as the monarchy did in order, in order to maintain their self-government. The main men of letters linked to the, to the political institutions of the country created a discourse that mixed juridical arguments with more mythic ones. We can highlight two points that could justify the maintenance of their particular laws. They did so, in the first place, as defenders of the territorial frontier. The Pyrenees and the Atlantic Sea were relevant theater uh, of distractions in the fights for hegemony all over the Christianity against French or English kings. This is particularly evident in the coat of arms of the two provinces shown in the picture, where you can see swords, pike, cannons. So this military discourse is very uh, apparent. But the territorial one was not the only frontier to be defended. During the early modern age, Spanish monarchy's main aim was to defend and spread Catholic faith all over the world. That is why it is also called the Catholic monarchy. Basques took advantage of what the historian Jose Ángel Achón called the Catholic moment, and Basque elites could trace a discourse in line with the main Spanish political theorists. 
The biblical Tubalian myth would work perfectly for that issue. According to the legend, after the flood, Tubal, Noah's grandson, was placed in the north of Spain. He transmitted different knowledges. Perhaps the most relevant for this panel is monotheism. The Basque language is another thing that Tubal uh, gave to the populations, uh, which is the living proof of this uh, same theory. And he also teached uh, the proper rules to, go to govern uh, the community and the iron fabrication or the iron works. Therefore, how would the most Catholic of the monarchs not wish to defend this heritage of divine origin in his own domains, which are, as you can see in the picture, very uh, diverse? The permanence of these elements from Tubal until the 16th century would demonstrate that Basques were never conquered. Hence, they never mixed with other races. They were pure of blood, that it's pure Christian and noble. At that time, the recently created Inquisition chased falsely converted Jews, in a moment when converted Jews were one of the fiercest competitors against Basques in administrative posts over the monarchy. So, we can understand part of the purity of blood statement in this anti-Semite Hispanic context. In sum, from the 16th to the 18th century, a concurrent cycle between the Spanish king and the Basque elites was evident. They worked at the king's service in the army, the navy, the administration, high clergy, or traded all over the world, while their relatives ruled their native communities with their particular laws and privileges and secured the frontier. These actions obviously were complementary. Those people were both a local oligarchy and an imperial elite all around the world. The discourse was very successful, obviously. Well, from the Catholic monarchy's point of view, its Basque subjects had been a good barrier uh, during the early modern age, not only against armies, but also against the reformed Christian heresies and even witchcraft. But from 1789 uh, on, a new heresy began to take shape at the north of the Pyrenees. This is the revolutionary ideology. The Inquisition worked hardly uh, in the borderlands to prevent a contagion, or what was considered a contagion, from the revolutionary propaganda, and new prosecutions were promoted in an unprecedented degree. You can see this graphic by Professor Andoni Artola, and you can see the comparison between the prosecutions in the Inquisitory uh, Tribunal during the all the 18th century. So the revolutionary years are uh, very uh, relevant. Well, the revolutionary wars that followed uh, this uh, kind of uh, prosecution faced the Spanish monarchy versus the French newborn republic. In the transit from the 18th to the beginning of the 19th centuries, the Basque country was invaded and occupied in different occasions. Different projects and de facto annexations were made, altering the so far established border and abolishing Basque particular laws for the first time. The hegemony of the described discourse and its religious features were obviously in danger. The first of these invasions occurred during the War of the Pyrenees, you've got the chronology there, and the French Republican army occupied a great part of the Basque country in this occasion. The French created a revolutionary administration and their rule was seen as anti-religious one. Not only they arrested clergymen and confiscated property of churches and refractories to finance the republic treasure, they also celebrated new brand revolutionary civic rituals, like the planting of the liberty trees. Mona Usuf had uh, long ago analyzed this kind of rituals, which aim was to break with the previous monarchic, popular and religious festivities. She speaks even of a transfer of sacrality. All those elements strongly impressed a very religious society. The endangerment of their religion was one of the arguments of the resistance. So it was all over Spain. The priests' uh, speeches uh, encouraged soldiers to fight a crusade against the impious French. But others seemed to negotiate with the revolutionaries about the possibility of creating a Basque Republic under French protection. 
Basque deputies implored the French that the Catholic faith should be maintained in such republic. However, the French did not accept and considered the land as conquered. From the French side, at least two projects of annexation were promoted, but according to Álvaro Aragón and Andoni Artola, uh, none seemed to include any consideration about the faith of Basques. The peace decreed the restoration of the Spanish king over Basque territories. It was evident for the crown in that moment that Basque provinces did not accomplish what was expected of them. Not only the defense was neglected, but some of their elites were even proved to be traitors. A historiography polemic was boosted against the Basque aforementioned discourse. Um, from the last quarter of the 18th century, the Tubalian myth was not admissible any longer. Uh, all apologists and detractors of the Basque liberties traced back the ethnic origins of the Basques, focusing on classic historical texts or linguistic approaches. Even if a demonic discourse of unconquerability, purity of blood, and all Christianity was maintained, intellectuals justified it considering the Basque descendants from Iberians or Cantabrians, the first civilizations who inhabited Spain. With the polemic at its height, the Peninsular War started against the new Fran uh, with, uh, started with a new French occupation, the Napoleonic one. The discourse to fight the impious French was reactivated at this moment, but again, while different regions of Spain lived a more or less warlike situation, Basque elites seemed to maintain faithful to the imperial armies and to the new king of Spain, Joseph I Bonaparte, which is the brother of Napoleon. Perhaps because Joseph did swear he would maintain the territorial integrity of the kingdom, but particular laws and Catholic religion. But the war and resistance of the most region uh, of the most regions of uh, Spain made Joseph's claim very unsuccessful. Napoleon had to turn back to Spain in several occasions. He thought uh, on ways on having a more direct rule over Spain and above all in the territories next to the border. Perhaps aware of these projects, the Basque French senator Josep Dominique Garat created an alternative project and sent it to the emperor himself. He would unite the seven Basque cantons, uh, the French and the Spanish ones, in a new polity under the protection of Napoleon. Unlike his French predecessors, his discourse was rooted in historical and religious reasons. It is a transformation of the old Basque hegemonic discourse into something else. For instance, the new polity's name speaks books about a origin search for Basque people, New Phoenicia. Garat argued that the Basques could create an auxiliary fleet for the Napoleonic Empire. Of course, the relation established between Basque and Phoenician does not seem a mere intellectual game. These were highly, highly renowned sailors during the ancient world, so Basques were the last Phoenician that cautiously kept their tongue and knowledges on navigation. In the Napoleonic Empire, nobility was just honorific. Purity of blood, of blood was not necessary, as they didn't need to justify uh, any anti-Semitism. Basques could now have a Semitic ethnic origin, but perhaps aware of the controversy that this may cause, Garat stated two important points. First, he highlights that Phoenicians were invaded by Hebrews. And second, he insists that Basques are very devout. They are very good Catholics and therefore good and useful citizens, he says. Apart from those features, Garat himself traces some interesting parallels between the Basque Pyrenean and other mountains. Um, they are not religious, but I believe it is relevant to highlight them in an alpine borderscape seminar. For example, in order to justify that Basques are better sailors than infantry soldiers, he mentioned the homesickness, the mal du pays, that led people to desertion, with, uh, each more, which is more common for him on mountain dwellers, particularly the ones in the Alps and in the Pyrenees. He also mentions that Basque language was spoken in different parts of the Mediterranean. 
the mountains of Corsica and the Pyrenees are mentioned and compared here. So, and this is my personal conjecture, according to this, uh, Napoleon himself would, would be a Basque descendant. We don't know if this uh, newly Basque naturalized uh, emperor uh, could read the project or not. However, it is interesting to see how Garat transforms former discourses in a new one, justifying the maintenance of Basque liberties in another uh, context. Anyway, the French would decree the annexation of the territories est to the Ebro River de facto with an imperial decree of 1810, again without having these liberties in mind. This decree established a Basque government under the imperial army. It was the first time that the particular laws of the country were officially abolished. So Garat's dream did not success. How did Basque interpret this annexation? It is significant that even among the supporters of the new Bonapartist regime, in my research on the Napoleonic occupation, I have not found a single piece evidence of any expression of joy at joining the empire. Basques seem feared for an uncertain future, breaking their laws, traditions, and last but not least, religion. Well, in order to conclude, uh, as we have seen, the Pyrenees border was not very stable during the revolutionary years. Different projects on integration of the Basque lands in the Spanish or French realms were tested. At the end, the Bourbon restoration led the Basque provinces in the Kingdom of Spain, and conservative as it was, the regime reinstituted the ancient laws and institutions of Basques. Basque historians of that time, of the Bourbon Restoration movement, justified their liberties by a discourse that had incorporated changes but permitted the continuity of the core ideas of the old hegemonic discourse. An exiled literati boldly, boldly stated in 1818 that the biblical origin of Basques was a myth, but the antiquity of Basques was out of any doubt. They were the primitive inhabitants of Spain. They maintained the primitive and pure language of that times. Their religion was a monotheist belief based on nature. When Basques first heard about Christ, they converted rapidly as their religion was very similar. Quote, the religion of the Basques is the purest and the most antique of all the Christendom. End of quote. Religiosity is a fundamental branch of all the discourses analyzed produced by Basque people denoting the actual role placed uh, in their society in all the imperial polities they were integrated in. However, at the 19th century, ethnic identity seemed to be more and more relevant. It seems that gradually another transfer of sacrality, if we can call it that way, was operated in Europe to focus on ethnic nations. In order to finish uh, with a third imperial insight to Basques, I vividly recommend to watch this 10-minute uh, long film Im Lande der Basken by Herbert Brieger. You can find it easily on the internet, and in these shots filtered through the language of Nazi propaganda, at some point the voiceover poses a central question that preoccupied specialists on race, the origin of the Basque people. Although the boys stated uh, that the most popular theory says they came from the Iberians, other imaginaries are traces. Um, as we are in Helsinki right now, I will quote the Finns as one of the candidates of, of Basque origins, but uh, the two ori other origins that interest me the most is those who build the Tower of Babel, so the Tubalian myth, and the Phoenicians, so Garat's project. As we can see, different myths of the different discourses remained in certain environments, perhaps in order to be revived if necessary. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Javier, for these uh, interesting insights uh, on the bus. I didn't know this uh, this film of Harry Harry but uh, Friga, and, and I will I will uh, have a look on it. Um, 
Perhaps uh, you you like to make a place uh, make a question, Ahmed, because you raised your hand. No, I'm just clapping. <laughs> ah, it was a clap. Okay, <laughs> thank you thank very you. much <laughs> for this uh, this thing. I think uh, there are a couple of things going together between the, the, the different um, um, the different uh, presentations, and we we come come to this uh, at the end. Uh, when we make the, the round, I think it's it's uh, uh, there are a co couple of things to discuss. Uh, so I also invite uh, the two, uh, participants to to keep, uh, and you can also place your questions uh, at the Wahoo uh, question and answer um, chat. Now that's two different things: chat and question and answer. But place it some somewhere, and we perhaps we find find it. Uh, so. Um, I invite um, Daniela Salvucci uh, to, to start with her presentation. Uh, Daniela, uh, I'm very happy that you, that you made it uh, to be here today. Uh, she is a junior researcher at the um, uh, Free University of Bolzano and Bolzano. Um, she, do, she does a lot of uh, ethnographies. She's a, a social and uh, anthropocultural uh, anthropologist. Um, mainly in the Indian region, but today uh, she will uh, talk about uh, where she now lives in uh, South Tyrol. So it's the first and present some first ideas she has on, on, the, on the topic. Thank you that you're here and uh, please go ahead, Daniela. Well, thank you very much, Tobias. Can you hear me? Yeah, everything yeah. will fine. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. So thank you for this introduction. Thank you very much for the organization together with Jan Peter for this panel and thank you very much to the participants and colleagues and it's also a pleasure for me to see you here again. So artifacts and the performances of sub tyrolean borderscape religiosities was well, so on the 15th of August 2019 in the morning together with my colleague I took the cable car from the town of Bolzen, Bolzano, the capital of the homonymous autonomous Italian province, also called Sutirol in German and Alto Adige in Italian, to reach Oberbolzen, Sopra Bolzano, a village of a little more than 1,000 inhabitants on the written renowned plateau over Bolzen at approximately uh, 1,200 200 meter on the sea level, you can see in the map. Uh, the, the travel of, of the cable car. And together with us, a young couple in their 20s and a woman, the mother of the boy, entered the cable. The young couple was wearing tracht, the traditional Tyrolean dress, made up of short leather trousers, the leather hosen, with straps for the boy, and a dress called birndl, with a low neckline and a white skirt, and an apron of the skirt and the blues under the dress for the girl. The boy spoke to his mother in Italian, where it to be late for the festival. Then he spoke to his girlfriend in English, explaining that the Kirchtag, the church day, is a celebration of a village patron saint. Today, it is the day of St. Mary's Assumption, Maria Himmelfahrt in German. To one, the church of the homonymous fraction of Oberbosen is dedicated. Well, here in, on the left, you can see a picture of the church of the fraction of Maria Himmelfahrt, and on the right, a picture of the village of Oberbozen sopra Bolzano. Oberbozen had been a peasant area with, with different familiar farms called Bauerhofer, uh, dwelt by the Bauer, the farmer, and his so called vertical joint family, the stem family. Since the, 16th, since, since the 16th century, the most prominent nobles and rich merchants of Bozen started to build their summer houses, their summer villas called summer frische Häuser, fresh summer houses in this area. Funding the village of Maria Himmelfahrt to enjoy the healthy climate of the plateau and escape the stuffiness and the insalubrious air of the town during summer due to the several swamps, swamps near the rivers of that time. 
You know, but both of these members of the upper class used to relax, play sport and hunt, thereby strengthening their business and family relations. In 1668, they funded an exclusive shooting association, the Schutzengesellschaft, still in existence, gathering to shoot at precious painted targets in a shooting stand. Some of these painted targets collected in the pavilion of the association in Maria Himmelfahrt were committed to celebrate marriage alliance among these families. They show the pleasant life of this upper class community in Oberbutzen in the past centuries. As we can see in the left picture, in a shooting target uh, made in 1738, illustrating scenes of hunting and playing, as well as a Kirchtag patronized by the Schutzengesellschaft. Yeah. On the right, a picture of a painted shooting target showing a festive procession in Oberbotzen in, in Maria Himmelfahrt in 1913. So we can see here the pavilion of the shooting association. Since the end of the 19th century, Oberbotzen, as well as other villages in the Ritten Plateau, became an attractive tourist resort where the Austrian, German, and English, above all bourgeoisie, went to holiday and walking around looking at the Dolomites landscape. Among them, there was also Branislav Malinowski, the famous social cultural anthropologist with his family who moved there in the 20s, in the 1920s. So, through photos, documentation as an ethnographic input on, religious, on the religious procession in Maria Himmelfahrt, and on the popular festival in Oberbotzen, this presentation discusses how artifacts and religious festive performances contribute to produce, express, and transform the South Tyrolean borderscape, raising questions on the historical role of religion and religiosities in this region. So on August the 15th, the Kirchtag starts in the little church of Maria Himmelfahrt with the Mass in German, which many people in Tracht visited. Then the procession begins, opened by the holders of the church holy banners and the saints' stages. The, then comes the volunteer fire brigade, brigade, as we've seen in the right picture. In front of the church, the white and red flag of the South Tyrol with the emblem, the Tyrolean eagle, uh, weaves side by side uh, to the white and yellow flag of the Vatican. The music cappella, the music band, follows, introduced by the holder of the white and red band banner and girls wearing the traditional Tracht dress of the, of the uh, Marketenderinnen, uh, who are those female figures who usually accompany the Schützen groups, as we see in, in the left picture. So the Schützen associations uh, nowadays refer to the Tyrolean local popular militias for the defense of the territory created in, in the 16th century that played a central role during the war against the revolutionary French army and against Napoleon in 1796-1797 and in 1809 and 1810 when the Tyrolean nationalism was forged around the figure of the Schützen leader, Andreas Hofer. In the Oberbosen and Music, Music Capelle's website, we, read, we can read that they dressed a Schützen uniform until 1950. Uh, anyway, the current traditional dress, both for men and women, still reminds to that one of the Schützen and Marketenderinnen, as we can see in the left picture. So the, process, the procession continues with the local authorities, the clergy and the members of the exclusive Schützengesellschaft, the descendants and of the ancient urban patriciate and the current owners of the Sommerfrische Häusern, men and women wearing the Ritter, man, Ritter mantle, the white mantle with colors of different colors, as we can see in the right picture. The music band plays religious march songs, the clergymen lead the rosary pray, the believers songs were following the march, tourists and audience take pictures and videos of the event. Then the procession goes 
uh, toward one of to, toward one of the villas in front and stop in front of the pavilion of the Schützengesellschaft and bless the villas and displays. Then it goes on through the meadows, enters the wood and comes back to the church where the holders leave the saint statues and the religious ancient banners. At this point, the music capella comes back to the pavilion of the shooting association and plays in front of the members of the, of the Schützengesellschaft before being invited to enter the pavilion for a buffet. At the same time, the Kirchtag festival has started uh, in Oberbozen, where in a middle of near the church, several gastronomic stands and common tables had been prepared. People and visitors come to eat popular meals, drink, looking at the mountains and enjoy the concert of the music capella once it is back from the pavilion, playing both folk and popular music. Behind the music stage, the children Children Games Park is full of people. In the afternoon, the music appelle organized a defile along the main street of Oberbozen with the Marketenderinnen, Rising Horses, and a group of Alpine horn, Alpine horn players playing their instruments for the joy of the tourists, while a woman offers, offers snaps schnapps, actually, offered schnapps, a little glass of hard liqueur to the audience, as, as we can see in the, in the right picture. From the other direction of the street, several uh, floats are arrive in parade uh, until to, to the space in front of the cable car station, carrying local, local producer, for instance, honey producers, who promote their products. Some of them were the traditional peasant blue apron, the shoots, as we can see, for example, here in, in the left picture. There are also shoe platteler shoe performers, so the traditional folk dancer, to amuse the many visitors who restlessly take pictures and record videos. Also, although, although these two performances of the Kichtag, the religious celebration in Maria Himmelfahrt and the, fe and the popular festival in Oberbozen are very different uh, to each other and the several experts. They both enact and stage kinesthetic symbols which link to social, cultural and political aspects of the South Tyrol as a borderscape. The iconographic and sensorial living landscapes people produce so these religious and festive performances refer, for instance, to the history of Tyrol, a region that belonged to the Austria, Austria-Hungarian Empire until the end of the First World War, when it was divided by the new political border between Austria and Italy. On the right side, you can see an image of the historical Tyrol. The official since the 1980 South Tyrolean flag which, for instance, waves in front of the church, is, for example, very similar to that one of the Austrian Tyrol. It only hugs vertically and shows some differences in the iconography of the emblem. The colors of this regional flag are recalled in the music, music capella's flag and banner. They often appear in festive decoration of places and sites, moreover. And then the uniforms of the music capella performers, as already said, remind those of Schützen and Marketenderinnen, figures associated to the ancient Ty Tyrolean popular militias for the defense of the territory. Then during the procession, the clergy, the music capella, and the members of the exclusive ancient Sch Schützengesellschaft parade one after the other through the meadows and the wood praying and singing religious songs in German, producing a living landscape that connects the past to the present, toward the future, reenacting the alliance among the urban and cosmopolitan upper class, the local inhabitants and the church. Nevertheless, tourists and new inhabitants, as myself, participate too, as spectators or as committed believers to the event. During the festival, the popular festival in Oberbots and the Music Capelle and the local recreate, recreative associations offer to visitors typical local gastronomy and music, 
as well as a parade that includes folkloristic dances and music and marketing of local products, co-producing with them a secular festive landscape, which is, however, associated to the religious event of the Saint Patron celebration. The landscape, indeed, could be conceived of as an ecological, social, cultural and political environment, one that unfolds its own temporalities, as Timingle said and is produced through everyday as well as ritual and festive practices and events. In the case of the religious and festive performances of the Kichtag in Oberbozen, they seem to enact the local landscape as a borderscape, as I already suggested. The idea of borderscape, uh, taken and reconfigurated from the geopolitical studies, actually held of us to <clears throat> Hell of has to include and overcame a set of concepts as borderland, which is the wider social cultural area that surrounds a border demarcation, frontier as the mobile and negotiated limit, and boundaries, the limits as perceived and negotiated by groups in their relations to each other, according to Frederick Barth. Especially borderscape referred directly on the one hand to the border as a political and administrative demarcation linking to political and ideological discourses, among which those a nation and nationalist, for instance. On the other hand, borderscape reminds us of different interconnected scapes, according to Apadurai, prompting us to consider the local global dimension of interconnected flows of people, media and images, for example, in the case of tourism and global markets. As an alpine borderscape region, the South Tyrol has been since long time a zone of transient and cultural in interchange. It has also been affected by bloody wars, the First and the Second World Wars, violent nationalism and ethnic conflicts. Embedded in this alpine border landscape, several artifacts, practices and performances refer to local religion and relig religiosities, as we have said. The ethnographic impulse I felt during the Kirchtag in 2019, thus, is just a starting point, the starting point of a more articulated ethnographic research I'm carrying out in this, in this region. It is also the occasion to raise some questions on the role of religion and of religiosities in the production of the local borderscapes. For example, on the one hand, according to historians such as Cole, the Catholic Church promoted a strong political regionalism during the anti-Napoleon Andreas, Hofer, Andreas Hof, Hofer's rebellion, also fostering a conservative traditional alliance among upper and lower social classes. On the other hand, local religious institutions have actively supported the political resistance of the local people against the violence of the nationalization as Italianization process under the Italian fascist, fascist regime. At the same time, they opposed the Nazism ideology and atrocity during the Second World War and accompanied in the second after war, the fighting for the regional autonomy as historical Gatterer underlined. Behind the sphere of the church, and of the institution, institutionalized religion, the concept of religiosities could help us to look at less institutional and unofficial practices and experience of spirituality, as well as at secular practices, such as popular festivals, still connected to religious performances. Many of these practices and performances are embedded within the landscape, as for instance, artifacts as the crosses on the mountain peaks or on the wayside uh, Holy Cross shrines, as we can see in the pictures, or as informal shrines people made putting little statue of the, vir of the Virgin in holes at the feet of the trees or in little caves along the paths. There are also practices of more explicit borderscape religiosities as in the case of the fires people light during the night, dedicated to the Jesus Holy Heart, to whom the historical Tyrol was consecrated 
in 1776 during the anti-Napoleon wars, still associated to the heroic figure of Andreas Hofer on the right side uh, and to the claim for, in certain case, also for independence of this region. Well, so I, I would like to stop here and just to set uh, the question how, how could we connect religiosities to borderscapes for the discussion. So thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Daniela. And I think uh, that's a topic we have to discuss in, in, the, in, in, the, in, in the final round because all, um, I also, in my, I will go on with my uh, lecture now because uh, it's very close to Daniela's and I think uh, some things will be complemented. And um, indeed, I also search for, for this connection between border and religion. And there is always something in the background, but it's not that much in the fore. I have the, I have still the, the, um, the, um, the, the impression. But um, we, um, that's why we, we, we are interested in this topic, because we don't know uh, all the answers. Uh, so I will start with my, um, with my thank you very much another time, Daniela. Uh, and I will start with my uh, with my presentation. Well, thank you very much, Tobias. Thanks. Which I have here. I'm uh, Tobias. Tobias Bos, also from the uh, Free University of Bolzano, Bozen, and I'm uh, a geographer, um, social cultural geographer. Um, uh, thank you very much for attending my uh, my talk about borderscapes and religion in South Tyrol. First, I li like to apologize because I I changed a bit my um, the, the title. I was a bit unhappy with the with the um, word impulse in my previous title, so I've start, substituted it with the term context in order not to imply uh, unidirectional causalities. Um, I'm still in the initial phase uh, of my investigation. I'm going to, exp uh, uh, to exhibit uh, first ideas about possible links between border and religion. Uh, to do so, I will expose some theoretical thoughts uh, on the possible connection between critical border studies and religion studies and connect them to historical dynamics, uh, which still influence contemporary life in South Tyrol. I try to identify possible lies, lines which follow in my coming investigation. I start with a short overview on South Tyrol borders. Uh, most people, me too, associate uh, the following uh, images with the term border, the borderline in maps, uh, and the installation of border controls, as, uh, as here in, uh, at the Brenner Pass, which mark the international uh, political boundary between. Italy and Austria. Additionally, thinking of border stones, for example. Uh, this line in the northern border of, uh, of South Tyrol is also the no northern border of South Tyrol, and it is a disputed international border of great importance for people living there and connected also to social and cultural boundaries. Borders are not unchangeable lines with stable function, as uh, indicated in these uh, maps. This gets also evident uh, if we have a look to the historical tracings and imaginings of different boundaries in the last 200 years in the Tyrolean region. As you see in this figure, the German historian Reinhard Stauber identifies four boundaries, uh, which are still seen by people as markers of their regional identity and differentiation. There are the administration boundary of the Green provinces, uh, just so in Daniela's um, a presentation building the historic uh, county of uh, Tyrol, which belonged to the First World War for long periods to the Austrian Hungary monarchy, you see here in black. Um, there is a line considered by inhabitants, linguists, and others uh, to be a language boundary, whatever this is, in orange, it's the orange line between Italian and German, uh, which coincides approximately with the contemporary administrative. Uh, administrative boundary between the autonomous Italian provinces of Bolzano, that's South Tyrol, and Trentino. 
Then we see in green a historic international border between the kingdoms of Bavaria and Italy in the, in, in the, in the beginning of the 19th century, which coincided more or less uh, to, with the ecclesiastical boundary uh, between the dioceses of Brixen and Trento here in Ukraine, which was uh, abolished in 1964. The current uh, international border which uh, also, also is called the Brenner Line in blue was established in 1918 19 uh, as a consequence of the First World War. We just saw that there are several territory imaginations in form of lines uh, in present day South Tyrol constituting its zone of different sorts of borders or boundaries, where, whereas the most of them uh, do not, uh, do, you do not perceive easily passing through the area. Other such that the language boundary is dispersed through the whole area and more complex than just the German, German Italian boundary as indicated in this, uh, in this scheme. Indeed, in the influential work Cole and Wolf wrote in 1974 uh, about the hidden frontier in northern Italy of this region, uh, the authors show that political borders uh, are involved in complex geographies of boundaries on political, economic, and social level. In this way, they often pervade the world communities and societies. Therefore, lines in maps seems to be a rather uh, hazardous uh, reduction of the co complex social cultural boundary system connected to political borders. Thus, in instead of uh, sticking to border lines in the following presentation, I will initiate to unravel the complex borderscapes, uh, which can be found mo mostly inside societies and not in maps. In line with others, authors of uh, critical border studies, I think of political borders as part of a system of social and cultural boundaries, which are involved in daily practices of differentiation and inclusion. <laughs> One of these authors, uh, on which I re re relay uh, mostly, is the Finnish uh, geographer Ansi Parsi, who works about the Finnish-Russian border. Uh, Parsi applies the social theory uh, of Berger and Lutman Mark work, The Social Construction of Reality to Border Studies, and enhance it with more specific models from uh, ethnographers, social anthropologists, and political geographers. Indeed, he shows that an international border can be seen as a social construction. Actually, spatial unities, uh, such as modern nation state, uh, states, are social productions made through a process Parsi calls social spatialization. Uh, but uh, people, also internalize the school, family, through news media, maps, etc., the common imaginations of, of the limits of countries, in which, uh, which in many cases com uh, are converted into taken for granted knowledge. Border communication and symbology gradually become institutions which are routinized forms of behavior and interpretation patterns. This process is a path he calls spatial socialization. Uh, this not only is done by communication, but also by often ritualized practices. The institutions in which per, uh, the person is socialized is important to consider to grasp the meaning of a border, which var var varies uh, considerably between groups and also on the individual level. This complex system of different kinds of boundaries, which refer, uh, which refer to political bound, uh, borders, and are involved in the reproduction can be described by the traditional term borderscapes as Clara, uh, Chiara, Pandila, and others author, uh, authors of critical border studies show. Um, as uh, Lukman illustrates in his book, The Invisible Religion, also religion can be conceived of as a social construction. Um, other authors I mentioned on the slide also indicate that it might be fruitful to have a look on the intersections between processes of the bordering and religious dynamics in the three dimensions mentioned by Parsi, the symbolic real, uh, reading and meaning system, institutionalization uh, and institutions, and discourses and practices, which uh, should also include perhaps uh, experiences and emotions. Um, one uh, interesting link I think is that religion is seen by some authors such, uh, such as Knoblauch as um, a meaning system which also gives final explanation and meaning, meaning that religion can provide a legitimizing context for boundaries and borders. Both border and religion seems to have a special, disi a special disciplining force and thus are imbued with power asymmetries. 
Having said this, I will now turn to my attempt to unravel some threads of the Waterscape religion complex of South Tyrol. I will expose rather disparate uh, situations and material to find traces about uh, uh, such traces such as journal articles, um, newspaper articles published during the First World War, and the description of a present-day ritual. I do so in order to show the great variety of the involvement of which religious actors, meanings and practices, and the construction and operation of political boundaries, and to present some lines of development in time. I don't like to get too deep into the historical development of the Brenner border line. John Mathieu and also Adrian Kornberg wrote good articles on the ideological underpinnings provided by geographers who provided the lines of argumentation in the aftermath of both world wars. Read them. Um, my colleague, the historian Andrea Di Michele, shows that, language, that the language boundary uh, developed uh, after the Second World War in a strongly institution, institutionalized imagination and seems to be another center of the South Tyrolean borderscape besides the Brenner line pervading the whole area and population. In South Tyrol, there are separated German, Italian, and Latino schools with own curricula, as well as a proportional distribution of political posts, um, offices, and employment in public services, which bases on, uh, on language. But let's start with the examples. Today's political borderlines are commonly considered as a national invention. Indeed, nation states are partly constructed uh, through negotiations on international borders. Uh, Alta writes, writes on the relation of nationalism and religion, uh, religion. In nationalism, the religious is sexualized uh, and the national sanctified. So it seems feasible to have a look on the nationalistic situation of the creation of, uh, of the political boundary and its most brutal manifestation, war, to find links between borders and religion. In situation of crisis and violence, questions on border and religion seems to be bound together in ritualistic and nationalistic rhetoric, uh, rhetoric but also physically uh, at a local level. Uh, here you see uh, in this picture uh, one of many examples of war memorials close to churches and as, uh, as or in, as in this case, including in the entrance wall of the church of St. Leonhard in South Tyrol. It is dedicated to the fallen soldiers in the battle against Bavarian and Napoleon troops uh, in 1809, the First World War and the Second World War. Indeed, letters of soldiers and uh, uh, regional newspapers of the First World War collected by Feichtinger uh, indicate uh, that Tyrolean religious newspapers, such as the Tiroler uh, and the Tiroler Volksbohle, mostly welcomed war in uh, war, war. In their view, war, war was necessary to defend the boundaries of Roman Catholic faith to the east of the Russian Orthodoxy and Islam of Turkey, and in the west uh, because of masonry coming from England, uh, England and France. Additionally, Catholic Italian influence had to be limited to ensure supremacy in the German speaking uh, of the German speaking Catholic, Catholics uh, in, uh, at the Vatican. Here you see a picture of the front page of uh, the Corda Volksbude, edited by two Catholic uh, Tyrolean priests. It seems that there can be identified important ecclesiastical actors uh, which uh, contributed to the uh, construction of different kinds of boundaries and also political borders. Surely there were also clerical opponents to war, uh, which needs further readings from my side. I have to admit. Now we come to a present day example. It is an example of a, of a ritualized ritualism in which religious contexts and frames play a decisive role. I will show you some photos of the uh, annual Memorial Day in honor of Sepp Cashflower, organized by the Sch uh, Schützen Company St. Paul's, the uh, local shooting association or company, as they call it, uh, in which all companies of the shooting union of South Tyrol, Tyrol, and Trentino, as well as some companies from, from Bavaria participate. Historically, they date back their foundation to the late medieval period, period 
uh, when he spoke to a tyro, um, which included sometimes Trentino, was consented the right to defend its borders uh, by themselves. The organizational form was by civil shooting companies instead of uh, a professional army. Sepp Kerschbaumer was a commander of a shooting company in the 50s and 60s and the leader of BAS, the South Tyrolean Liberation Committee, which aimed for the autonomy of the German-speaking Tyrolean population in South Tyrol and the right uh, uh, of their self-determination. He died in 1964 in the prison of Verona. Uh, one, uh, on this day in December, Around 2,000 members, men, women, and some young people participated in the memorial march. First, they take formation, a formation lining up uh, by companies. Here you see the start of the of the march, uh, which goes then to the to the church, and after the mass, they will go to the cemetery. In this photo, we are inside the church. The priest, who in this case was an active member of the shooting union, stressed in his sermon legitimacy uh, of the struggle uh, for autonomy and the fact this cash farmer was very religious. Um, the last was mentioned several times. Indeed, it, it seems uh, from the speech I, uh, speeches I witnessed, not only in this time, but also in all, uh, other memorial days, uh, that a good member of these shooting companies uh, should, be a should be a faithful Catholic. But this I have also to verify another time. The march finishes at the grave of Ash Baumer, at the cemetery where the leaders of the shooting union and guests of honor give their speeches in which they stress the importance of the status of autonomy of the province South Tyrol, which was granted in 1948 and considerably extended in 1971. Although the Brenner border is accepted in the speeches, its tracing is still considered as an unjustified act. This is a picture taken in St. Leonard. It shows the central square of the village where the figures of Andreas Hofer, what Daniela already mentioned, and Joachim Haspinger on his right were placed. Andreas Hofer was the leader of a, of a local shooting company fighting the Bavarian and Napoleon troops in 1809, who became the military and political leader of historic Tyrol, of all uh, historic Tyrol for some months. Uh, he's uh, considered a hero still today. He is also said to have been a very, 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 very faithful person or man who was influenced by local clerics such as Joachim Haspinger on his uh, right. The picture shows another time the connection between the church, civil religion, civil military, and uh, originalism. To conclude, in order to identify and uh, understand religious context in South Tyrolean borderscape, Parsi's analytical scheme of bringing together symbols, institutions, practices, and discourses, perhaps also emotion and experiences, seems to be a good theoretical starting point. We saw that in the case of South Tyrol, there can be identified a strong connection between religion and military actions um, or incidences. Indeed, Brambilla and uh, Jones already urged that border studies should include more developed models of uh, conflict and violence in their writings. Uh, additionally, we saw that historic Tyrol is still a decisive frame uh, for the imagination of South Tyrol, also Daniela showed it. Another important frame is language in this area. It is a very potent institutionalized marker believed to be the reason for the production and reproduction of different cultures in this region. It might be interesting to see the role the church and religiosity uh, play in language issues. I didn't find uh, that much traces till, till now. Uh, border conflicts are commemorated in rituals such as the presented. The investigation of other rituals, practices, and cults, such as the very much celebrated secret heart of uh, Jesus, uh, might be useful to get further insights in the religious symbolic dream of conflict in South Tyrol. There seems to be a strong celebration of faithful persons in South Tyrol as regional heroes. So an actor not, uh, network analysis or about use field analysis might bring interesting results on present day on contemporary configurations. I like to include the people living there in my future considerations much more than I did so far. And with this promise, 
I conclude my uh, my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And there are some um, some bibliography if you are interested. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I have a look if there are some questions already in the chat, but uh, there isn't. So um, I I welcome everybody to, uh, to to make their questions, their questions um, uh, would you like to, to share. Just raise your hand in uh, in in Zoom or send a message by the chat or in Zoom or via the the Vuva question and answer sheet. Uh, in. Okay, please, Ahmed, uh, start. Yeah. Thank you all for these precious uh, presentations. I found read, all of them really interesting and captivating. And there are some uh, intriguing similarities between Dersim and the case of Kurdish Alevis and uh, some of those regions you shared with us. I would like to ask uh, more about this environmental destruction to Shah Mahmoud, because it's almost the same case. There has been a guerrilla warfare in Dersim region since the late 1960s, but it got intensified in, during the 1990s. The Turkish state used, even used some chemical weapons. They throw some kind of box, a caterpillar, you know, it eats the leaves of the forest. Uh, but interestingly, this environmental destruction of Dersim, Dersim region, especially this Tunjeli province, during the 2000s, after the millennium, uh, opened a road to a new understanding of religion. They people, uh, when you ask them what do you believe in, they say, yes, we are the children of Rahaki, it means the path of the truth, and they define themselves as the only child or only or the only society of the true, the true path. They distinguish themselves from other ordinary humans even. But uh, it's a totally different religion actually they believe in right now. And this, for example, this environmental discourses are the leading components of this religious discourse right now. Uh, and what about in Afghanistan, this environmental distract, uh, distraction, what effects uh, that occurred on the understanding of religion or maybe ethnic identities, uh, the effect of violence actually. Uh, you have to, to put on your, your audio. Excuse me. Uh, thank you very much, Ahmed, for drawing attention to um, shall we say, the environmental impacts of war um, on our region. And I think the, um, the uh, theme is, is comparable, but there's a scale differentiation. In Afghanistan, it's truly global, almost unlimited uh, variations of munitions from defoliants, to bunker buster bombs and really a very um, intense air war. Whereas I don't know of the extent of the air combat and in Turkey, I suspect it's more of a ground war. No, they always use this aerial combat, air bombardment. They are. Mm. They're really hard to reach, you know. Some places there used to be some uh, fortifications of guerrillas. So it is really hard to reach there despite mass losses. So uh -huh. they always use this air bombardment, even now, even today. For example, every summer, they annually burn the forests in Dersim. They use some kind of uh, napalm bombs and some other stuff, yeah. Oh, I, I wasn't aware of that. I'm very sorry to hear that. In Afghanistan, um, there's the other problem of really intense censorship um, a, lack, a lack of data. 
Um, for example, when it comes to the impact of depleted uranium in the groundwater, there is uh, abundant anecdotal evidence for birth defects in both animals and humans, but there's no sustained sort of um, scientific data collection and you know broadcasting of that problem. So um, I think the information about the environmental consequences of war are subjected to the censorship of war. And um, what that makes very difficult in Afghanistan is a broad countrywide understanding of these impacts of war. I still, uh, I am not able to answer your question about how these environmental impacts of war have affected ethnic identities or religious practices. Um, uh, but I am in hot pursuit of sort of um, data, for example, from the Atomic Energy Commission of Afghanistan. I'm in contact with someone there who says that they are not able to investigate pro, uh, in a sustained or programmatic way depleted uranium from the post-2001 war. What they are commissioned to do is search for depleted uranium from um, downed Soviet military equipment that used depleted uranium to encase their electronics in their cockpits. And so the Afghan government is looking for radiation from Soviet machinery and not in the groundwaters in the east or the north. And so it's again a political manipulation um, uh, of, of the science. So uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm not able to comment really on the okay. religious and uh, other social impacts of, of war at this stage. So, but I'm, I appreciate the question greatly. Um, and it, it triggers a number of questions to the rest of you. Uh, uh, really, uh, with Javier's attention to kind of empires and identity and religious purity, uh, racial purity, and um, Javier, can I please ask you if, if it's okay, Ahmed? No, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't uh, answer in any detail. No, no, uh, we are just discussing, and uh, okay. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, to, to, Tobias, may I please ask Javier? Um, a question about that. Yeah, of course, of course. Go, go on. Um, Javier, I'm, I'm really just again uh, so happy to see you. I'm so interested in uh, your region. C could you please elaborate on the Phoenician hypothesis of Basque origins? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, well, I mean, the, the the basis of all those different theories are at, at a point uh, that they are not finding a single evidence of who are uh, Basque's as an, uh, as ancestors. Okay, so they are trying to reach uh, documentation that uh, supports one theory or another. Uh, it's, mainly, it's mainly from the 18th century on. Okay, so they, they started finding, okay, they are Iberians, they are Cantabrians, they are, there are plenty of theories. But one theory uh, is focusing on this Phoenician uh, ancestry. I don't know exactly when and who started uh, this theory. Um, I know there are certain authors um, in France in the final part of the 18th century that they claim that the um, uh, shield of the kingdom of Navarre, which would be another uh, Basque territory, just not the three provinces, but another one. So uh, he, um, he says that uh, this shield came from the Phoenicians. I don't know exactly um, when this is originated. I don't know exactly... Um, who did originate that, but at the time of Garat, 
he's starting to um, believe that okay historical documents are not valid because they they have been through uh, a lot of distortion through the time so the ancient uh, historians are not valid anymore so there is one clue the language and linguistically comparing different toponymics and so on in Several regions of the Mediterranean, we, Garat says that there is a common language going on there. Okay, so uh, I think it's not, um, I think it's very meaningful that at this very same time uh, that Garat is uh, developing his theory uh, in France, in the, in the center of the French Empire, another association is created um, about the um, Celtic past of the, uh, let's say, the European main uh, people. Um, and from that time on, they started to uh, say that, okay, French people are descended from Gauls, etc. So, and, and if you compare the two maps, uh, the sphere of influence of Gauls is finishing just more or less at, at the pioneers. So I can imagine that Garat is trying to, to propose a, a parallel theory or kind of uh, something like that. So it involves both material, cultural evidence and linguistic evidence. Um, language. Linguistic evidence. Mm -hmm. I would say linguistic evidence because the material evidence is just symbolic evidence, like the shield or some kind of uh, symbolism that they are transforming in order to, in my opinion, in order to fit this, this theory. The, 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 the investigation is mainly linguistic. Thank you. Thank you. Javier, perhaps uh, I have a question uh, also on, on this uh, linguistic thing. Uh, yeah. You make this, um, you make um, discourse analysis and what did you find um, links or, or connection between Basque language and religion? Um, if, if, uh, if Basques, you, I, I think you mentioned that Basques are uh, were thought to be more more faithful. Um, you also said yeah. that, that this and this was, but what was this um, connected to language or more yeah. on this uh, racial issue, yeah. of purity, pure blood? Um, is there a direct link between language, past yeah. language, and religion, or is it always via the language equals uh, ethnicity uh, or ra race? and then uh, go to the religion, direct links. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. They are quite, you cannot just separate them. So it's very difficult to, to say when they are referring to one thing or the other. But um, with all the linguistic theories uh, going around, uh, there were several theories that uh, they were defending that the Basque language was the one uh, spoken in the paradise. And there is another the another branch which, uh, which is um, defending that angels spoke in Basque. Okay, so, and this is, and surprisingly, this last theory is from the, ninth, from the beginning of the 19th century. So it's quite a modern uh, theory. Um, even though those theories were not, um, how to say, were not the main theories uh, at the time. Okay, so the main theories are, uh, okay, we, we don't know exactly where this language is coming from. So it must be uh, from an old uh, and primitive peoples inhabiting the, the peninsula. And then you have like different a bunch of theories. But uh, I would say that this is the link uh, between language and, and religion, the most evident one. Um, also, they are believing that as a language, Basque uh, can give you the meaning of the words that uh, are being recalled. Okay, so as it is a very old and pure language uh, with a kind of Kabbalistic uh, form of knowledge, they are uh, saying that there are uh, important uh, messages uh, inside this this language. That that would be my <laughs> my answer. Well, that was very good because in 
Also, I see some connection in the South Tyrolean uh, case, but I cannot grasp them today. I, I cannot say nothing. So I, I was wondering uh, if you have more evidence, but that's uh, oh, it's hmm. some traces. Thank you. I think uh, Daniela wanted to say something. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for your presentations. I have some questions. And so let's start with uh, Hamet. Uh, I would like to ask you if the shifting toward uh, an ecological discourses within uh, the, the, the fighting and resistance in the scheme is due to the higher international, it's also due to the higher international attention toward ecological issues of, of nowadays. I mean, it's, it's a kind of strategical shifting. Mm. What, what do you think about this? Th this is my, my question to Hamet. And then I have also, sh should I pose the questions all together? Perhaps it's better if, uh, if Ahmed is, is responding and then uh, yeah. ask the yeah. next question. Well, actually, it's exactly it is, I would say. Yeah, this, there, this Kurdish Ali community is more like a transnational community right now. And they have a really strong uh, European diasporic organizations, associations established, especially in Germany. And they even managed to make uh, German authorities to uh, push them on to Turkish authorities. Uh, rising the issue of this 1938 genocidal massacre because you know the Turkish authorities, the Turkish states have problems with this Armenian genocide uh, in international uh, politics and now the second one uh, comes after this. So uh, yeah it's exactly a politics, ethnopolitics of this Kurdish associations and it's a success I would say for them. So uh, they have been establishing in starting from the 1990s uh, when the, the biggest devastation of Tunjel province has occurred. Uh, the Turkish state evacuated all rural settlements. They killed almost all domesticated animals and forced people to abandon their villages. They burned down the villages. Tens of thousands of people uh, forcefully evacuated, most of them killed publicly. Uh, and these associations started to rise an awareness uh, by using this more and more these ecological discourses. And starting after the, uh, the 2000 millennium, the Turkish state decided to conduct more uh, hydroelectric, hydroelectric dams on almost all rivers of Dersim to submerge the uh, literally, to, they decided to submerge the province, you know. Uh, and there was a really big resistance for it, and it still continues. And now the discourses uh, are much more related with religion itself, because this Rahaki religion is really unique to Tur Kurdish Alevis. Um, uh, we need more time to explain this. This Alevism is a very, um, it's a conceptualizing term, actually. There are Alevis from Balkans to Caucasus and even to the south of this Middle East. They speak diverse languages. They speak Turkish, Kurdish, they speak Arabic. They follow different uh, religious traditions. But Kurdish Alevis, Kurdish Alevism is a new ethnic identity, a new definition for themselves. So, uh, yeah, they found this uh, ecological discourse, uh, they found it as a very strong weapon uh, to get some alliances in international uh, levels, uh, to force Turkish state to stop this destruction on environment and on society in their sin. Yeah. Thank you very much, Hamid. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I also would like to ask to Shaha Mahmoud. Um, what, how, how do Taliban's have dealt have dealt with have dealt with the sacred trees and also with the timber trade in Afghanistan? In they well, what, when they were at, I mean, where they governed the country? Do, can you say something about this? Well, um, 
in the first instance, it's important to recognize that the Taliban are quite a heterogeneous group with a shifting history towards, for example, opium production, where there are um, sort of prohibitions on uh, various things like opium production or timber export. And then those bans or prohibitions are removed. So there's kind of a, there, there's, from what I can tell, um, shifting policies towards these environmental issues, if we consider agriculture and timber export environmental issues. And so um, I don't know if there's a single set mm. of policies in this regard. Um, like everything, it's a trilateral dynamic, um, at least between the Talibs, the Afghan government and international actors, all of which have, um, to some extent, competing policies towards environmental issues. Um, what the Talibs are, um, let's say, generically known for are um, agitation against the kinds of war crimes such you know, as, as detention and rape, but also environmental um, uh, uh, crimes. The, the Taliban have a mobility about them as a kind of governing form. There's no single Talib capital or a single court. And so their structure is a mobile one. And I'm not sure how they organizationally kind of integrate various regional um, environmental data sets. I, I, I just don't know. I don't know. There's so much that is, again, veiled under securitization um, cloaks in Afghanistan. So I'm, I'm sorry I'm not able to respond again very well. Thank you for what you have said. Thanks a lot. I, sure. I would like, I, I just have the last question for Javier Esteban, actually. I would like to ask you if, um, if in the Basque countries, both in France and in Spain, if there are some memories or commemorations nowadays of the French wars in mm. some way. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, there are some commemorations. Mm, well, some of some of them were created due to the bicentenary of of the invasion and occupation and so on. But they stopped there. Uh, on the one hand, and there is one specific place where uh, it's particularly commemorated. This kind of cycle is particularly commemorated because it's. Um, the city of San Sebastian, where um, the city was destroyed in in 1813, uh, but it was not destroyed by the French, but by the English and Portuguese troops. Okay, so um, the commemoration is about this uh, sack, uh, which is the 31st of August, and they made a kind of, they organized a kind of parade um, about this event. There is another celebration in this same city, uh, which is celebrated uh, in January, which is called the Tamborrada. And uh, it's, uh, it's another kind of parade because it's a mock parade, or at least at its origin, it was a mock parade. So it's, it's a kind of, mm, it, it, as far as I know, it was originated as a mock parade against the French. So people were just dressing uh, as they could and they were ridiculizing the French people. But uh, the irony of the thing is that uh, nowadays uh, it's a very solemn uh, festivity. So people would uh, they would uh, differ, uh, they would create like two groups in those parades. So ones would be the soldiers, and the others would be um, 
the um, the uh, how can I say the, the 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 common people, but the common people would be um, dressed as uh, cooks, as uh, chefs. Okay, nowadays because it it's, it has been transformed everything, uh, and and people um, believes that the to be the soldier is to be more solemn and and uh, and so on. So. There is a kind of distortion of of the origin of of this festivity apparently, and I think those two festivities in that same city are the ones that I can remember, you know, with kind of historical uh, trajectory until until now. Perhaps there is another one, but I I can't I can't recall it right now. Thank you, thank you very much, Javier. Thanks. Okay, uh, so can I ask yeah. a, a general? Well, thank you all of you for for your uh, interesting lectures. Um, well, first of all, for uh, Tobias, perhaps you are interested in a book which is um, which is called it, it's um, it's in English and it's also in Spanish. Uh, it's called uh, Apologists and Detractors of the Basque Language. So it's a kind of compendium of all these apologists and detractors, and there you can find the different um, motives why uh, Basque language was uh, um, was attacked or uh, was uh, you know positioned uh, as a very important language. The author is uh, Juan Madariaga. The surname is M A D A R. I A G A, but you can easily find it like apologists and detractors. Okay. And so my my thought about uh, different um, things that had been said here goes a little bit uh, in in the in uh, Daniela's uh, question. Um, it's about these armed companies that make parades in different places, right? We can see them in Tyrol. Uh, we can see them also in the in the Basque space where there are uh, quite a lot of festivities involving this kind of parades, normally with people uh, carrying um, arms, uh, gunfire arms and uniformed, okay? But with uniforms more from the 19th century, let's say from the middle 19th century, etc. And nowadays they are like big festivities from, from different towns. The interesting thing is, and here may go one of the questions, is that in Tyrol I've seen that um, the religious component is very important in all those kind of parades, while in the Basque country, it was originally important, but it lo it has lost all the religious importance so far. So there is also a mass, but it's not a massive uh, um, event that people uh, go there. Um, of course, these parades in, in in the Basque case, at least, are very old. Uh, in the early modern age, we can see this kind of parades, uh, but it was kind of the revision of the troops. So every citizen um, that had rights in a single town should go once in a year uh, properly armed and to show that he could uh, be um, a citizen in this uh, town. Okay, so he had the right to uh, be presented to the town hall, etc., etc. And another uh, possible question or, or you know, doubt that I have is if in the Asian borderscape uh, presented, uh, there is a kind of similar uh, parade or festivity, including this kind of uh, armed uh, parades. Thank you. Yes, perhaps um, Ahmed Ishaha, do you know something? Uh, have you seen any any such thing of this kind? As uh, I think in, in Daniela's and mine, there are some uh, some examples. Yeah, in in Dersen, there's an annual festival. It has been over twenty years now, and uh, it's very famous. And it's an international festival 
it started in the late uh, 90s and it was organized by those associations, these uh, local associations. Their first aim was to uh, create an international awareness of uh, about such atrocities committing in Dersim. And but the second aim was to bring people back to Dersim because uh, the Turkish state has a, a serious uh, intention to depopulize the province. So uh, it started in the late 90s and still go, going on. This and festival also one of the main as aspects in creation of this new understanding of this Kurdish Alevi identity in the 21st century. And also it's one of the most important aspects of the reinvention or evolution of the religious beliefs into such ecological discourses from its uh, traditional roots, I would say. Is there also a military element involved in this festival or is it more? Well, actually there is a deep sympathy on guerrillas who fights against the Turkish state. So each festival, especially during the late 90s and early in the 2000s, almost it takes uh, it, it lasts almost a week, actually. Tens of thousands of people comes from, especially from Western Europe to Dersim. And uh, during these days, always clashes occur between the police forces and the uh, Dersim people, of course. Yeah. There are a lot of illegal organizations so armed orga organizations, <laughs> uh, their sympathizants uh, yeah, demonstrates and the police involves the, those demonstrations and these clashes occur. Uh, to answer for the Afghanistan case, no, to my knowledge, there's no um, kind of public uh, parading, or particularly military parading which again, it's an active war zone and that kind of concentration would re receive. Um, and again, the, the surveillance of Afghanistan is just, you know, pan like a panopticon with drones and satellites and it's a really highly surveilled. Groups don't gather. Uh, Ahmed, may I please pose a question about language? And- um, uh, Yes, please. The uh, and please help me understand, first of all, just Kurdish has two main dialects, do I understand? Yes. And two different uh, writing systems as well. Is that correct? Uh, well, actually, the Kurdish nationalists use this uh, Latin alphabet for both dialects. But this is a really big uh, discussion, you know, this is a political debate, actually. Does Kurdish language have two dialects or do these different dialects are indeed different languages? For example, there are some people speak Kurmanjki, not Kurmanji. Kurmanji is known as, as usual in Kurdish, you know, but uh, Kurmanjki is a, from my point of view, it's a different language, actually. Yes, they are related. They are in the family of this Indo-European language tree, both of them are. And this Kermanki is really close to Farsi, uh, uh, but it's a totally different culture. You know, these Kurdish Alevis are totally different from the rest of those Kurdish societies. Mm. First of all, they are Alevis, not Sunni Muslims. So they even don't believe in heaven or hell, Abrahamic heaven or hell. Uh, they even don't believe that their society comes from Adam and Eve. They, they have really an interesting Genesis mythology, for example. That's how they perceive the land. The Dersim is unique to themselves. This is why the Dersim surrounded with those high mountain ranges is a is another geography. It's a kind of symbol of geography and uh, an imaginary geography flow of sacred places. It's created for them especially. I, uh, I ask because and I this language and this Kermanjki uh, is a special part of this uh, religious belief. Uh, when you make your praying in Turkish, it doesn't make sense, for example. It makes sense when you speak Kermanjki. 
Okay. Is there vocabulary overlap, for example, uh, for trees or mountains or rivers between the dialects? Yes, yes, of course. There are some. And in distinct from Turkish or Persian? Totally distinct from Turkish, but it's close to Persian. So what is the word for mountain in Kermanchi? Koye. Ko and ko. In Koye, yeah. Koye. Uh -huh. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so interested uh, in the linguistic element of Kurdish identity. Yeah, there's a uh, special ethnologist group in in Iran today. They are called Elihak. Have you ever uh, heard Elihaks? Yeah. These those Elihaks in Iran and some Ezidis in Syria and in the northern Iraq and these Kurdish Alevis in the eastern Turkey have some common uh, roots regarding their religious beliefs. Wow. They share most uh, myth mythological narratives, even some rituals, uh, especially those regarding to sacred places. They called it Ziyare or Ziyaret in Turkish. Yeah. Yeah. Ziyare, Ziyare, yeah. Are, are there sacred lineages of kind of, of religious if they're so the same? Yes, of course. Uh, this is also unique to Kurdish Alevis. There are two main components. One of them is sacred lineages. For example, you cannot be converted, one cannot be converted into this Kurdish Alevi enclosed tribal religious sphere. You have to born into it. You know? So you one born into it as a member of a sacred lineage or a, as a member of a Talib tribe. Talib means follower, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Can oh. you want to to say something? Well, just to remain on the linguistic <laughs> sphere. I would like to ask to uh, to Javier. Well, thank you very much for uh, uh, for referring to these uh, armed companies and parades. Do do they have a name? I mean, these companies. How how are they called? They are the, the oldest one are called Alardes, A L A R D E. Alarde. Um, Alarde is uh, in Spanish would be something like I don't know demonstrate, like, well like show up or something like that. Um, those are the historical ones, uh, but nowadays they can be called like in very different ways, like escopeteros or something like that. So um, gunfire carriers. But yeah, the historical one is, is just, it was known like uh, with the name of Alarde and it was only uh, uh, avail available for what was called uh, vecinos. Uh, the, the vecino figures is a juridical particular one. So it's that dweller or of a place who has the rights uh, to be a part of the highest uh, part of the community. So they must be male, um, older than 25 year old and with a certain uh well with a proprietor with a um, house or or something like that so so yeah it it was restricted and that's why it was a uh, a very important thing to go into the middle of the town with your sword or with your uh, weapon Thank you. Then, of course, it transformed nowadays uh, to something that it's just made for for fun. But there is another kind of um, argument nowadays, and is uh, in certain parts. I mean, in, in other parts, it's it's quite um, normalized. But in in certain towns, uh, there are quite important polemics uh, for and against the participation of women in those parades. Okay, and, and they are uh, lived in a very, um, I don't know, the, the arguments are very heavy, even even nowadays. After all, they, they have a place since long, since the beginning, 
Og så tager hun Daniel og sagde, at det er meget katendt af hende. They make, uh, they are not the, the, the big group, I think, in South Road, there are 3,700 um, male uh, shooters, <laughs> uh, members in, in the shooting union, and uh, around 700, 800 uh, market tender, and 500, around 500 in, in the youth. So they are a, a small group. Um, But they have a, a long history and tradition in, in, inside of this, this in, in these companies, uh, and now there are some some discussions to to um, to enlarge the, the or to empower them a bit more, uh, and also to, to be more sensible in, in giving speeches and mm -hmm. all this um, so gendering a bit. Also, they will never gender the speech German. German uh, speech can be gendered in, um, hmm. but uh, they they discuss more in, in, in these directions. I also know that in France, uh, in the in the southern part, there, there are parades from the Pravat, which are also so such companies, shooting companies, hmm. and uh, what is uh, perhaps also. Um, But also, also has to be known uh, about this shooting union in uh, South Tyrol. It's not said that they really can very well shoot. They are not uh, some. They have also an, an, uh, an apartment uh, where they they can uh, they make um, or they can uh, exercise shooting. But actually, most of them do not shoot. They are there because of the tradition. Uh, of, uh, Of, uh, uh, of celebrating together uh, these or commemorate this um, uh, this um, this past, I, I said of Andreas uh, of uh, of Kerschbaumer, of Höfel, uh, five or six big memorial days uh, on, on the fallen um, former bus uh, members, and uh, they all they are really active. In, in the in the communities and uh, on a local scale, they organize organize small festivities. They are in in all of these processions, as Daniel Daniel showed. They are present. Um, sometimes they organize it together with the church, and uh, sometimes they gather uh, for political reasons. And so and then they make really huge huge parades. Um, and normally with uh, With quite strong religious um, symbols, like the, um, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, they, they display, and the thorn, um, the thorn crown of Jesus, that are the 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 the, the, the both, both are the, the main symbols or religious sim sim symbology, symbology, I think. Mm -hmm. um, think I don't know. Yeah. It seems like we've really highlighted, um, <clears throat> I guess, two themes that I don't recall speaking uh, in a sustained way it, when we met in Germany. And that's the sort of linguistic complexity of our borderlands. I don't recall mm. any sustained attention comparatively to that. No, I and, don't either. Yeah. And also this question, um, I think Ahmed and I are speaking of a, Um, a militarized environment with guns that are used for killing. And your um, militarization has been, uh, you know, uh, ritualized and sort of uh, sp sporting, shooting clubs, not killing clubs. And th th there seems to be some um, room for maybe not armaments but but how kind of military cultures are expressed in our in our in our shared borderlands i i, I don't know i don't recall a, for perhaps a fusion of symbology military religion symbology displayed uh, in, the, in the same uh, in the same practices or rituals cults this yeah. could be because also in the but we we have very Uh, different regions. Uh, you are 
in, in, in servants of war, unfortunately, where everything is um, quite heavy since uh, since long. Uh, in, the, in the South Tyrolean and also, I guess, in the Basque, the, the, um, uh, they, are, um, they, 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 they have autonomous status for the regions, they, they have political power, and in, in, in the case of South Tyrol nowadays, they have real political power in, uh, on, on this uh, province level, uh, so they can decide a lot of things on their own. Um, and perhaps also what has to be considered is that they, um, they were disarmed for some for some uh, for some uh, uh, periods in, in uh, after the wars after, after getting uh, part of, of Italy they they, uh, they couldn't show anymore their arms in in public and uh, as I gathered from in formal interviews, they um, they, uh, they they can wear arms in, in public uh, uh, since the, the, the they are allowed uh, only since the two thousands mm. to wear their arms again. Mm. Well, trying to react a little bit uh, with uh, Shah Mahmoud. Uh, thought which is very interesting and I think there are two important avenues of research here. Um, yeah, it's completely true that uh, each land we are studying is quite different and perhaps there are very important differences between the two European borderscapes and the two Asian borderscapes and their uh, situation right now. Uh, but the thing is that, of course, those ritual of uh, symbolic militarization, perhaps, uh, they survive until nowadays, but they were also deployed in the um, uh, early modern age. And that's the interesting thing. So at the moment where the border was a really hot spot of the confrontation between um, uh, France and Spain, to, to speak it very simply, uh, they were uh, creating this kind of symbolic uh, power or armed symbolicism. It is also true that it cannot be compared the uh, militaris militarized uh, space of the early modern age and the militarized space of the 21st. So it's a completely different context. But uh, the thing is that symbolic militarization existed uh, in the Basque country since long ago. And when it was a real, um, a real military active uh, frontier, uh, that's why I, uh, that's why my question of, of that, of those parallels also with, with your uh, lands, uh, the lands that you study and even in, in the past. No, but uh, it's quite uh, striking that we all elaborated on the same things in the, in the end without on, on this conflictual zone. The uh, border also can be, uh, could be uh, thought of as a connection instead, but we didn't think of this. It didn't really connect things. It separated mostly violently in our cases. What interests me really is the sort of, um, when we think of multilingual environments, it's often misleading. Um, the, the impression given is often misleading because the languages are not, you know, shared or equal. There, there's, there's inequality in these language relations. That is, is, I think, um, something to pursue comparatively if we meet again. Mm -hmm. um, think so. <clears throat> Perhaps there's also no, some some kind of uh, emotional um, links to 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 language, which give this hierarchy um, or hierarchy or which. <laughs> In which triggers or which influences a bit the, the kind of treating other persons. 
but this would be that's very dif difficult to to work on, I guess. But uh, well, Tobias, what's interesting yeah. is the you know um, in a multilingual environment, uh, it's not necessarily a multi-religious environment, mm. you know? and so the question is that in each particular borderscape, which language is inflected with religiosity and how does that impact the larger set of social and linguistic relations in that borderscape, mm. right? Inserting the question of religion into li linguistic hierarchies is the, you know, mm. Such as yeah. the case in the First World War, which I put, uh, it was one situation where, where language, in the end, um, being both Roman Catholics, um, German speaking, and, 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 and the Italians, uh, then neither, then they, they tried to, to, to establish a, a border also, these this clerics, uh, to say, okay, we are uh, Roman Catholics, but we don't have the voice uh, in, in church, uh, which we de deserve because Italians, they can, they have a huge influence, but we German speaking uh, Catholics, we, 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 are, why, uh, we are the most, uh, uh, we, we are um, quantitatively more people. I don't know if it's really right because many German speaking people are, are, are not Catholics. Um, but perhaps in, in these days, I, I didn't count. Uh, we, we have to, to, we deserve a better, better treatment. So they, they make this boundary first against the other box, then against um, Islam, against uh, masonry, and then also against other Catholics. So you find always reason, if it seems. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, answering to the, it was very interesting, of course, for me, because I did my PhD on the linguistic, uh, well, the, 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 the um, printed documents in Basque language in the 18th and beginning of the 19th century. So it was basically a linguistic uh, study. And yeah, it's very interesting how they, 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 they recall those different realities of the speakers in this deglossic reality where where you have like different levels, uh, different social levels, and each level speaks in one language or different places, and in each uh, one language is the best one to use. Um, in the Basque case, the Basque literature or the literature produced in Basque, I mean, it's not just fiction literature, but all kind of literature, um, was boosted very significantly for uh, religious texts and it was in the 18th century mainly in the in the southern uh, basque part because in the french basque part it it was boosted in the 17th century um so the literature you can find it's mainly religious almost a hundred percent is religious in the 18th century then in the 19th century it starts changing but of course this is just uh, uh, one manifestation one cultural manifestation which is the printed uh, documents uh, the spoken language it's much uh, much more interesting and much more difficult to to track well for for ahmed and i it's this question of arabic and islam you know um, it also, for, for Afghanistan in particular, the presence of Arab fighters has led to a new hybrid identity. Um, Afghan Arabs, you know, um, literally. Uh, so Egyptians or Libyans who come and have experience in the jihad in Afghanistan really adopt, they become Afghans in a, a nomenclature way, and uh, you know the um, again, that's a sort of global migration network. The Afghan war, um, but it brings with it a lot of uh, uh, li linguistic issues. 
um, particularly with Arabic speakers in the region and, and the power of Arabic in Islam. Ahmed, um, can I have one final question to you about the Alevis? And is it appropriate to invoke the concept of Sufism for the Alevis? Yeah, at, at, at some point, yes. Alevism is a really big conceptual term and it includes those sophistic understandings of Islam too. But also it includes very diverse understandings of Islam, like for example, Kurdish Alevis. Some of them say, yes, they we are the uh, pure uh, reflection of Islam itself, but they do not follow any kind of Islamic rules mm -hmm. in practical level. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's a big debate actually. And there are many actors, there are many representatives, there are really diverse politics regarding these Alevi issues. Yeah. Do those sectarian Islamic identities figure into the guerrilla um, kind of organizations as they do in Afghanistan? Um, Kurdish nationalists, yes, they use these religious discourses to uh, fill in their ranks. They recruit during their recruiting their ranks, you know. They, for example, uh, propaganda that they fight for the rights for Alevis. But the, the main uh, characteristic of this guerrilla warfare is social, uh, socialism. There are, there are some socialist organizations since the late 90, uh, 1960s, and they are actually leading the war in Dersim. They gave the character. So that's uh, also why this new understanding of this religion is why full of these modern ideas and ideologies. For example, gender equality, for example, this environmental awareness. Uh, yeah. Or equality in every aspect of religious and social life. Yeah. There is a deep politicization process uh, in the case of Kurdish Alevis, and it evolved into a kind of 21st century religion, somehow, full of with modern ideas, uh, socialist ideas. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah and there's a rivalry between those sacred lineages and with, the, with those non-human entities in the shape of mountains, because People go to mountains, not to their sacred lineages, because mountains give them much more uh, authority to conduct their own beliefs, own understandings. Uh, yeah, there's much more space for individual piety there. And this individual piety involves uh, politics rather than religious prayers or uh, rituals. Yeah? full of politics. When you go to a pilgrimage site, you sit with the people, you feast with the people, and you talk about only politics. And that's the religion there. <laughs> that's also and and in, a way, in a way, the mountains of Dersim is a place of international solidarity of socialist people. Yeah. There are some Europeans went to their fight uh, alongside with those guerrillas and some of them lost their lives. And they are, of course, being commemorated there. It's also interesting that uh, this um, religious gatherings, uh, or also in our case, these uh, this parades, um, are very much political. In, in many occasions, they would say, uh, okay, but uh, the religion stuff in, in, in general isn't political. So we can say what we want uh, if it's inside this uh, frame of religion, but uh, it's in, in reality, it's, it's a, there are no political speeches. Also, the sermon of this priest was uh, a political statement <laughs> for me, she made. But it's more, uh, it's Treated more more subtle for perhaps in, in the in our context in, in South Tyrol because we are also it's very crowded in, in comparison to Afghanistan I guess mm. and uh, and the region of that. Yeah. it seems to me that the um, 
room for further conversation remains large. Um, I, I hope we can pursue these matters uh, as a group again in a sustained way. Well, in the end, we, we, we saw some, some things, the, the, the connection, religion, military and politics yep. remains uh, perhaps it's, uh, it's one of the, the major uh, line yep. uh, we, we have to pursue. The thing of mountain really here, loud mountain landscape, actually in, in South Tyrol, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical, I'm not... There are some hints, but it's very difficult to connect, and also the, uh, the language. There are hints, but it's also difficult to connect to religion, to religion, to religion. Um, few instances that they do it, mm. or, which I see, but I do it didn't. Uh, this also can be that uh, something very interesting is coming up in this, in this line. I, will you report to Jorn? Uh, are, are you still in touch with Jorn? And yeah, I'm um, in touch with Jorn and also with Peter if it gets Peter. better again. And then we, uh, we have to see what we can do. Also, if you if you would like to to go ahead with something and make something, uh, invite us. Yeah, I and, uh, I, I think. As far as the United States Academy goes, the COVID situation has put everything really um, on, on hold. Online also, it's not, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, you can some at some point some, make something in this direction. Uh, yeah. Also uh, thinking that's also something which is always necessary for this publication. But um, in my case in South Tyrol, I don't have data. Sensory. I made some things previous to, to COVID. Uh, I'm always a bit more in the, in the contemporary uh, investigation, observations, interviews and such stuff. And um, interviews is, is difficult if you don't have made uh, already, uh, if you don't have uh, already some access so to, to the community, to establish access. Mm, it's, uh, and then make interviews via the internet or telephone. It's not the same. I made in other contexts. I made interviews which are quite well, um, but uh, in my case, I'm not really able. I think to to make a qualitative good paper at the moment. That's mm. so my problem a bit. To be honest, I know you you work since longer on this topic. Very, very little writing though, Tobias, so I, I, I'm, I, I, I share some of uh, your aspirations for, for publication here. Okay, I think uh, come to an end. I think we have also some, some lines with which we can discuss in the future. We, let's where we create at once, I would say, in this uh, small round. Perhaps somebody else is joining us the next time. I keep in touch with Jörn and with uh, Peter, and uh, we keep you informed if, uh, the next, for, for the next events. Uh, perhaps somebody likes to, to join us also in Daniela's um, mountain culture talks. Um, yeah, thank you, Daniela, for those. Yep. And um, yeah, thank you very much that you that you were here and uh, they discussed with us. Uh, with me. Oh, thank uh, you so much. Thank, thank you today. very much. Please yeah. give my regards to Jorn and Peter and anyone you. you're in touch with. I'm happy that you're both in the same uh, Tobias and Danielle in the same uh, same mountain environment together. <laughs> He's on the, in the, the, uh, the room next to me. Okay. <laughs> that, that, that's comforting. So very nice to see you, Javier Ahmed. Also, best, best of luck in your work. I, I hope we have a chance to keep in touch. Yeah, sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, also, for your uh, lectures.